Amen and amen. Man, y'all sound like you've had an extra hour of sleep. Praise the Lord for His goodness. Or maybe you're sugared up from the candy, one or the other. We never announce ahead of time, fall back, because it's okay if you show up early. Guys, open with me to Mark chapter 9. We'll be looking at the first 13 verses. Mark chapter 9 as the house lights come on. Open up your copy of God's Word alongside our family this morning. We are here November 1st, yesterday being October 31st, Halloween. And maybe it's something you didn't realize about Halloween, but in fact, on October 31st, it's the one night in all the year, out of all the other dates, that more people come out of their homes, walk around their neighborhoods, interact in a person with those they live around more than any other day of the year. Interesting, isn't it? In fact, that's the primary aspect of wisdom we use when we plan our church, uh, church trunk or treat here. We intentionally don't have it on the actual day of Halloween because we think it would be pretty foolish on the day that all the lost among our mission field are outside their homes for us then to pull you as believers from those mission fields to come on campus if we truly believe God's providentially placed you there in your cul-de-sacs, in your communities, as lampstands to give hope to the hopeless, to be a bomb for the hurting. And so we celebrate Halloween last night. I, I hope some of you did. I don't celebrate all the witchcraftery or whatever you might think it is, okay? We just have a good time with our family, all right? We're going to have a good time with our church family tonight. But I find it really interesting how this one night out of all the years when all the people come out more than any other event all the year. Um, it doesn't matter, it's not Independence Day, it's not New Year's Eve, but it's October 31st. And the participation, legit, I mean, you've noticed it, all time high every year. I mean, even the person who might live next door to you, who pulls into their driveway, goes into their garage on a normal day, closes their garage door before ever turning their car off or opening their door to get out, and then they just get out and they never see you, they never say hi. Anybody got a neighbor like that? Maybe you're that bad neighbor. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> have this interaction, and I find it really interesting. I mean, have you ever wondered really why of this day, out of all the year, is there this increase, this heightened interaction where people come out and participate like nothing else on the calendar? Well, I think it's because on this day, October 31st, it's an event where it's accepted and it's also expected for children, adults, for entire families, entire communities to come alongside one another for an evening and put things on the outward expressions of your life where you cover up the realities of your life, you cover up the realities of who you are, and you completely suppress it for the day of October 31st. We're in the festivities of Halloween. No one sees who you really are. No one sees what you're truly going through. You're able to masquerade around. And obviously it's something that the lost and the saved world embrace just the same. Because it's comfortable, isn't it? It's nice being able just to, for a little bit, not to be on, but just to cover up and hide away. Mask the reality of who you are in your life and show an outward expression that is not completely accurate of the brokenness and what you're wading through in this fallen world. It's comfortable. In fact, it's pretty convenient too. We've, we've come to understand that on a whole other level with this COVID craziness, right? Wearing a face mask. I don't even brush my teeth half the time, church. I definitely don't try to pick food out of my teeth because you ain't going to see it most of the time. And you ladies, where are you at, ladies? I'm certain most of you are only using makeup for the top half of your face these days. And if you haven't been doing it, you're probably like, well, that's a good idea. I'm going to try that. That's the only thing you're getting out of today's sermon. Man, isn't that a weighty reality? 
masquerading around, expressing something outwardly because it's covering up an inward reality. I'm burdened because I think the tragedy is too often as believers, I'm talking about believers now, we profess to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Too often, I believe, the glimpse the world gets of us is not just covering up on October 31st, but they see us steeped in our mask, steeped in our covering and suppressing the reality and the hardships we're walking through instead of living out transformation in which Jesus, God the Son, came to die and rose from the dead on our behalf for. That's what this text talks about today. The title is Transformation, Not Tradition. And it's not your 35-year-old pastor trying to harp on someone steeped in tradition or saying all tradition is bad. I went to Texas A&M Fighting Texas Aggie Band class of 2007. Whoop! And I'm extra spiritual because of it, okay? I love tradition. But tradition should only be a vehicle in its appropriate place, always geared toward living out transformation that Jesus has come to provide to all humanity. So that's what the text is about this morning. The reminder where these disciples, based on their expectations that were firmed up in generations of tradition, they almost missed the king before their very eyes. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Let's pick up in this story and we'll remember what's going on here. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Okay, so you're not caught up in that too much. This is some prophecy, but it's not too complicated, okay? Okay. The Scriptures are very plainly spoken, straightforward. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm about to take some of you up on a mountaintop, and you're going to see the fullness of me and my glory and my power, how I will come again one day in the kingdom, and you're going to see it before you die on this earth. And that's what we see take place in this passage. There's some more we can dig into that, but that's as far as we're going to go at this point, so I share that in hopes that it doesn't hinder what else God wants to show you this morning. So Jesus makes that statement. And then in verse 2, after he said, you're going to see the fullness of this power in the kingdom, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them. So we have this straightforward prophecy. But I want to remind you here as well as this context. Remember the disciples were there in Caesarea Philippi. And finally, they, they had this elated and so excited um, confirmation that Jesus truly is the King. He has come. He's the Messiah to deliver all humanity. But for as excited and as elated as they are, is the, the confirmation that Jesus is the King. When Jesus confirms the King's mission, the mission that the King has come to die... The mission that, yes, he is the roaring lion of Judah, but before he fulfills that, he must do the work of a lamb. And when the mission of Jesus is confirmed, remember these disciples were greatly disoriented. They were confused how this fit into their expectations that had been steeped in generations of tradition. They weren't just disoriented, but they were discouraged. They were disheartened. Wait a minute, you've come to die? What does that mean? We've given up everything to follow you. And you're saying it's all because you've just come to die? So in this confirmation of who Jesus is and His mission, He invites these three, an intimate invitation to these three to join Him on top of the mountain. It's similar to what He's done on a couple other occasions up to this point. He has this inner circle. He's got the 12 original disciples, but He's got this inner circle of three who he'll be entrusting on a deeper level for these three to then teach and lead the disciples and to teach and lead those apostles in the future. He did it there at Jairus' house. Remember Jairus, he had his daughter who died? 
Jesus came to Jairus' home. They were already planning the funeral for his daughter. And Jesus, along with these three, went into the privacy of his daughter's room. And Jesus brought her back from the dead. We see it later in the Gospel account. In the Garden of Gethsemane. We're not all twelve of the disciples, but these three, this intimate setting of Peter, James, and John, joined Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus is praying so heavily. Father, if there's another way, would you provide it? But nonetheless, thy will be done. And similar here is this intimate invitation where Jesus calls these three, Peter, James, and John, and he leads them up this mountain. And look what happens. It says Jesus was transfigured. The literal Greek word there is the exact same used in other cases of the New Testament as transformation. So Jesus went up on this mountain and He was transformed before their very eyes. The figure that they knew of Jesus, fully God, fully man, here's your $20 word of the day, the hypostatic union. Anybody ever hear that before? That's just a fun word to say. The hypostatic union of Jesus is what the disciples knew up to this point. Basically meaning that Jesus, God the Son, was on the earth as fully God. He never diminished His deity. He was, he's always been, always will be fully God the Son. But in that, He was also simultaneously fully human. It wasn't 50% God, 50% man. Fully God, fully man. And over the last couple of years, as the disciples had followed Jesus in His public ministry... They knew His figure. They knew Him to be God the Son as fully God and fully man. But as Jesus brought these three in this intimate invitation up to the mountain, His figure transformed. He changed before their very eyes and Jesus shed off the flesh that He'd been clothed in. The glory that had been hidden, that had been veiled under the humanity He was living in simultaneously as God the Son and fully human had been removed for a moment where now for the first time these three individuals, Peter, James, and John, saw Jesus in the fullness of His glory. Saw Jesus in the fullness of His power as King, God the Son. What an unspeakable sight that must have been. In fact, all John Mark can describe based on the words of Peter. Remember, Peter gave John Mark the words to write here for Mark's account here in the gospel all he can talk about is what his clothes look like he said they were whiter than anybody could ever bleach a garment he was transfigured before them his clothes became radiant intensely white not baseball white pants as they still have the stains of the dirt from sliding into home plates but brilliant white more than bleach could ever provide and there appeared before them elijah verse 4 with moses and these two these two heroes from the old testament elijah and moses they were talking with jesus it says now here we don't know in mark's account exactly what they were talking about but you can look at a couple other gospel accounts luke's account gives us insight to what they're actually talking about You have Moses, you have the side of Elijah, and you have Jesus. And the three of these are conversing while Jesus is there so radiant, so so much more wider than anyone could bleach a garment. And what they're talking about is Jesus' mission. Elijah and Moses are conversing with Jesus about His planned departure. That Him as the King has come to die. Notice as they're speaking... Verse 5, it picks up that Peter comes up with something to do, but nowhere between verse, and five, uh, verse 4 and 5, nowhere in the other Gospel accounts that have the transfiguration um, of Jesus, nowhere does it say Jesus rebuked what Moses and Elijah were talking about. Jesus didn't say, wait a minute, that, that mission is not what I've come to do. No, that's not appropriate. No, that's not a good strategy for me as the King of Kings. But he affirms it. Why Moses? Why Elijah? Think about in the Old Testament, that was the only so-called Bible they had during that day. The Bible made up of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. 
and the prophets led by Elijah. So what this showed right there on the top of that mountain with Jesus radiantly displayed in the beauty of His glory. He was affirming to Peter. He was affirming to James and John. I know this does not make sense. I know this does not fit the tradition that has formed and shaped your expectations for me as your king. But here we have Moses and Elijah who represent the totality of Old Testament. And they have affirmed it the entire time and they are reminding you here right now, I have come to die. We know Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus Himself says, I did not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. Every little detail. Imagine the kindness that Peter, James, and John would have received at that moment. They they were questioning, I'm sure. This doesn't make sense. Lord, it's not a good plan. You're the king. You've come to die. No, that surely there must be a better way. And Jesus takes them to the mountaintop. Shows them Elijah, shows them Moses, and affirms to them, affirms to them, yes, this has been the plan from the very beginning when I knew mankind would fall and be in need of deliverance. I must die. So Peter, in Peter fashion, I mean, how quickly he fell from Caesarea Philippi where he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After that, Peter said to Jesus, while he's so radiantly displayed, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Duh. (laughs) Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And we've got to give Peter some credit. Whether he knows exactly what's going on, or he is completely scared straight, he is going to be talking about something. He is going to be trying to do something. He's like, Lord, it is good that we are here. I am scared straight. I don't know what is going on, but I think we should build some tents. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. See, there's a lot of other prophecy going on here we're not going to spend much time on, but basically what's happening, this involves their expectation based on the Old Testament of the coming kingdom. The return of Elijah, the return of Moses, surely now is the time that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lion of Judah, will come in and establish His kingdom. So Peter's like, yes, let's set up boots, let's worship you. Let's set up these tents and honor you as you want to usher in your kingdom and overthrow that oppressive Roman Empire. Notice what happens in the next verse. And don't miss what it's linked to either. The blurry vision The lack of understanding comes as a direct result of Peter, James, and John losing sight of the transformation Jesus is emphasizing as a result of their expectations grounded in tradition. And because Peter can't see past his tradition, verse 7 says, a cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud. And God spoke. Similar to what we see at the River Jordan when Jesus was baptized. This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Peter, hush! Peter, quit trying to be so busy. Him, Elijah, and Moses were talking. Jesus was in the fullness of His glory. He dropped His flesh for a moment for you to see something so powerful and have a great reminder to live out the transformation He provides. Shut your mouth and listen to My Son. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. I mean, this roller coaster of emotions... This jumping all over the place by Peter, I mean, it's understandable. It had to have been a struggle. 
not only in his present generation, but every generation before him, they had worn that cloak of tradition for so long. I mean, it was their favorite, most coziest, comfortable sweater they put on every time. Isaiah prophesied about a roaring lion of Judah. That was the predominant um, teaching of the prophet Isaiah. We are looking for that lion. But as a result of being so steeped in that tradition, they lost sight that there was first coming a transformation that could only happen through a lamb as a lamb comes to the slaughter, silent, offered as a once for all sacrifice. The rest of these 13 verses, verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged them, tell no one what they'd seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Again, that purpose is twofold. One, Jesus wants to make sure they understand the King's mission before they just go talking about the King and confuse folks. Also, it wasn't quite time for Him to converge on Jerusalem and completely fulfill the Father's will for His earthly ministry. Verse 10, So they kept the matter to themselves. Yeah, I would have too. Yeah, we went up on the mountain. We saw Jesus like never before. And because I opened my mouth, he shut it down. I wouldn't be telling anybody either. And as they kept the matter to themselves, look at the end of verse 10. They continued questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked Jesus, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that He should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? This is still Jesus speaking. But I tell you, right? He, he's emphasizing this in verse 13. He, he's providing this strong reminder which should confirm to them that regardless of how nonsensical it may seem according to their tradition, it is His heavenly Father's will and calling on His life. I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to Him whatever they pleased as it is written. What a struggle it must have been. Absolutely. And then God the Father from the heavens brings in the clouds, overshadows the situation. He says, this is my son. Listen to him. Makes you think of Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything will be added unto you. Don't worry about setting up tents, tents for Moses, Elijah, and me. Seek the son. It's not about you coming to something that you're comfortable with. It's not about something you've seen before and then it should always be the case. It always has been, always is now, and always will be about Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was crucified, risen from the dead, and will reign eternally with all authority over heaven and on earth. God says, listen to Him. The question I've asked myself as I've gone through this narrative and I say that because I want you to remember it's not me hurling these challenges on you as if I'm immune. No, I've been dealing with it all week, church. You struggle with something here? Me too. What area of my life, what area of your life, has become cloudy and filled with shadows? Because you've lost sight of the transformation God desires in your life. Because you've been steeped in what you know. You've been steeped in what's been before. What area of your life has become cloudy? Has just been filled with shadows? And Jesus is Heavenly Father. God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, is calling out, listen to the Son. Listen to His voice. Quit trusting in these other things. About that, what what area of your life is he calling for you to listen to his voice? And it is directly linked to these traditions that are overwhelming transformation for Peter and the other two on that mountaintop. Their vision had become so clouded 
So shadowed by their expectations and their familiarity that they almost missed the King of Kings before their very eyes. For us, we've got to come to a place where we say, God, based on who Jesus is, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, I want to live my life out in transformation. And not tradition. I don't want to allow my feelings to form who I am and how I follow Jesus. I don't want to cover things up to the point where someone sees me for what I want them to see me as rather than who I truly am and the life I'm truly living out as a result of a follower of Jesus. So Jesus provides this reminder on the mountaintop. This transformation of Himself before them to remind them it's not about your tradition. It's not about what you feel. It's not about you being three hours better every week on a Sunday morning gathering. It's not about this religiosity of tradition or feeling or looks outside. It's all about an inward reality that is totally changed. Where just as Jesus on the mountaintop, His flesh was dropped from Him. We too are to die to our old selves. Where beneath is a rebirth, a regeneration only provided by God the Son, our Lord and Savior. And I know this this type of title does not sit well with many of you. We all have our preconceived ideas of exactly what does this mean? Transformation, not tradition. You mean there's no good thing within tradition? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if the guys who followed most intimately in person with Jesus allowed their tradition to supplant transformation, then we are prone to do that all the more. It means when we consider things like worship, where Satan has such a stronghold and slips in so easily, we don't lose sight that it's about transformation all in the name of tradition. We don't say, oh, hymns are better than modern music, or there's no modern songs that talk about the theology of our great and wonderful God. Did you not hear the first song we opened up with? I will not be formed by feelings, but only truth. And if the cross causes transformation, I will be crucified with you. That is oozing with Scripture if you weren't aware. I know there's plenty of bad hymns and there's plenty of bad theology and new songs as well. We'll use the Spirit inside of us to discern the truth. We'll cling to it. We're called to live out transformation based on the truth, not based on our feelings. Right? Because we don't miss the transformation of Jesus just in the, in the section or the, the arena of worship wars. But there are areas in our lives where we consciously make a decision to live something out based on what we feel rather than what we know He is telling us to do. And only you and the spirit inside of you between you and God know exactly what that is. Maybe it's at your workplace in issues of integrity. Maybe it's in relationships, students. Maybe you're dating the other gender as if you're married. You were never intended to date someone in the same manner and treat them as if you were married to them. Stop it. You're going to continue to be left dissatisfied and broken and fractured. Same is true for those who know God's given you the one to marry. We know there's something sacred about the the marriage bed and that union. And until that time comes, it is worth the wait because waiting means it is within the design God has provided and God has spoken and instructed regardless of all those crazy hormones we feel just because that's why we're made. Okay, guys? We can be honest in here. Oh, Oh, uncomfortable. Why do you even say that? It's the truth. It's how we're made. not called to mask up, cover ourselves up. All for the sake of coming in here three hours a week, feel better, look better. 
Maybe you can walk through these doors and speak with a little less color for a moment before we go out to the real world again. But God is crying out from heaven, saying, listen to my son in every area of your life. And when you do that, not even the most important election in history will shake you. I looked something up. I've got to bring it on my phone because I wasn't even a, a thought to my mom and daddy at this time, but i got an illustration here from a brokerage firm. E.F. Hutton from the 70s. Anybody heard of that? See, I don't have the age, but I can look some stuff up, okay? This brokerage firm ran an unforgettable series of TV commercials, this guy says. I trust him, I guess. The setup was always similar. Two people in a crowded public place talking about financial matters. One shares the wisdom of some broker. The other person responds, well, my broker's E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, dot, dot, dot. And at that moment, the surrounding crowd is immediately quiet. Everyone leans in forward eagerly to hear what E.F. Hutton has to say. The voiceover explains, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Even as a teenage boy with no interest in financial markets, this pastor says, I learned that E.F. Hutton had a voice worth hearing, a powerful voice indeed. God the Father is speaking into the clouded, disoriented area of your life and saying, listen to me. And here's your reminder of truth. According to Genesis, God's voice is even more powerful than E.F. Hutton. When God speaks... He actually creates. So instead of living and listening to tradition or feelings or clothing yourself in religion for an outward expression, when you listen to God and allow His truth and grace to speak into you, there is life that is breathed in you and through you and all around you. Let there be light. Light comes into existence. When God says, let the earth put forth vegetation, the earth is filled with plants and trees. If this is true, then surely we ought to pay close attention to what God says. We all have many voices speaking. Some may be wise, well worth heeding. Others may be trivial, distracting, downright evil. But in the midst of a cacophony of voices, may God give us grace to hear His. May we find the will and the way to quiet down enough to hear what God has to say. May it be true of us. Especially believers on Jesus as Lord and Savior. May it be true of us that when God talks, we listen. What area of your life is clouded and shadowed because you've stopped listening to the voice of God? Say, Pastor, well, how do you do that? They had Jesus with, with them on earth. How do you do that? We've got 66 books. And you seek the power and the discernment of the Spirit inside of you, and then you confirm it with these books. And you listen to it, and you do it. My last question is this. So we've talked about believers here. But there's some of you here. You've heard about this Jesus. You've heard His voice prompting you, stirring you, causing you unrest. But up to this point in your life, you've just ignored it. Would you listen to the voice of Jesus today in this place? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who came to this earth, very God of very God, lived a perfect life, but still died on a tree as a curse because of your sin. Because of your irreconcilable differences before Almighty God. He was buried and on the third day He rose from the dead. That should you profess faith on that truth, should you believe on Jesus as Lord and Savior according to the Scriptures, you shall be saved. You shall be transfigured. You shall be transformed and once for all eternally secure. Would you listen to Jesus today?